Hey, good. <coughs> good afternoon. I'm really happy to be here. I've never spoken before such an esteemed audience before, so I'm nervous. Uh, but nevertheless, very happy to be able to speak about my work at the Beale Lecture. It's a great honor. Thank you. So, my thesis, uh, which I defended sometime in 2013, in January to be precise, was trying to machine to deal with changing processing times and rate modifying activities. Uh, I'm currently working as a senior lecturer at the University of Greenwich, so lecturing is my day job, but I'm slightly nervous because I've never been recorded before. <laughs> and I am conscious about my hair. <laughs> Okay, so <clears throat> I'll give you a quick introduction about the kind of work I was involved in. So basically, my PhD thesis was a methodological piece of work, uh, mostly theoretical in nature. So basically, I could go out in the park on a sunny day and work. So a computer was not always needed. So that was uh, something which I really enjoyed. Uh, <clears throat> so what we basically tried to do was uh, we tried to bring some governance into a really widespread field of study, which was dealing with changing processing times. And we proposed a unified modeling framework to basically track and advance the current state of art in this field. So we developed a wide range of efficient algorithms <coughs> that solve uh, these relevant scheduling problems. And a lot of them have never been studied before, even though they were practically even. So, I'll go through a quick uh, background on what classical scheduling is like and then move on to what my particular research was on. So, classical scheduling, typically we have n jobs which are supposed to be scheduled in a certain number of machines. So, each job J uh, comes from a set N, which could be 1, 2, 3, 4, 2 N, and they have fixed parameters such as processing times, release dates, etc. So an optimal schedule for a job, for all jobs in set N is uh, basically such uh, a combination that a certain objective function can be minimized. So this objective function can be a make span, which is basically the total length of the schedule, or the total sum of completion times, or the number of tardy jobs, etc. So we have a certain number of jobs, we basically need to schedule them in a way that a certain objective function is minimized. Uh, in the last 15 to 20 years, there has been a lot of development in this area, so we have tried to make models more practically relevant. And one of the efforts in this direction has been to make the processing times variable. So, <clears throat> uh, in classical scheduling models, as I said, all of these uh, parameters were predefined. Now, in the last 15 to 20 years, we have introduced variable processing times as well. Uh, so the main rationale be uh, <coughs> behind introducing such models is that a machine environment can undergo learning or deterioration. So you could have a machine which deteriorates over time, so if you process more jobs, it may take more time as uh, the number of jobs are scheduled. Conversely, if an environment is learning, then as the number of jobs increases, uh, the processing times keep decreasing. So, to take into account such environments, such as learning and deterioration, we basically have a number of models that can incorporate such effects. So the most popular three models are as follows. So the first one is a position-dependent position effect, in which the actual processing time of a job depends on the position of the job itself. So if PJ is the normal processing time for job, uh, in case there's no deterioration or learning, then in the case of deterioration or learning, it will be multiplied by a factor which is a function of the position. The second one is a time-dependent effect in which the processing time for job varies dependent on a function of the start time of the job, which is time. So, this one is very different from the first one because you could have a job which is five hours long and that will uh, have some impact on the processing time of the next job. The third one is known as the cumulative effect, which is basically uh, the actual processing time of a job is dependent on a function 
of all jobs that have been scheduled previously. So, <clears throat> an example of uh, a time-dependent schedule is a linear model in which uh, the actual processing time for job is dependent linearly on <coughs> the start time tau, and for the cumulative effect as well, there is a linear model <coughs> linearly related to the sum of all previously completed jobs. So, these are the three most important models that we will be dealing with in the thesis, and to enhance these effects, what we normally do is introduce some rate modifying activities. Uh, why these are important is because in every uh, machine environment, you have issues like breakdown, uh, deterioration, maintenance, change of workers, and so such rate modifying activities basically <coughs> uh, prevent the processing times to reach extreme values. For example, if there were no such activities to break the increase or decrease of processing times, then we could have an infinite increase in uh, the value of the processing time because of a deterioration environment. So rate modifying activity can be something like maintenance or a change of worker. Uh, any activity which breaks the increase or decrease in the processing times. So the first of such combined models in which changing processing times and rate modifying activities were uh, introduced in a single model was in 2008, in which deterioration machine conditions were combined with maintenance activities that fully restored machine conditions. So basically, whenever we have rate modifying activity, what we do is a schedule is divided into a number of groups. In this case, for example, we have two rate modifying activities, so we can see that the schedule is divided into three groups. So if each rate modifying activity, or RMA as I will call it from now on, is identical in nature, then the three groups will be indistinguishable. So just to break it down, we schedule a number of jobs in group one, then we introduce some maintenance period, or we change a worker, or we do something which affects the normal uh, processing times. Then we have another set of jobs which are scheduled in group two. Then again, we process, uh, <coughs> we have some rate modifying activity, and then in a third group, we have some more jobs. So in general, if we have k rate modifying activities, we will have k plus one groups. So, up till now on, most of the models considered uh, assumed that all of these rate modifying activities are identical. It means that every maintenance activity which has been performed has been identical in nature, uh, which doesn't sound very practical because in a workshop or in a factory or anywhere where you're dealing jobs, it could be grid computing, uh, you may have many different activities which may change the state of the machine differently. So it's highly unlikely that each and every time the same rate modifying activity will be involved. So my work has been in development of such new rate modifying activities and incorporating them in a uh, scheduling model. So we generalize this concept and introduce the idea that the rate modifying activities need not be identical and they need not fully restore the machine to its original state. So it is possible that the machine, uh, the maintenance activity may have different durations, they, have, they may have different effect on the state of the machine, and so on. Now, different RMAs will result in these groups to be different in nature, so that they are no longer identical. Now that causes a problem, because earlier if all the groups were identical, then you could just condense them into a single group, and the maths for one group will apply to all. Now since all groups are no longer identical, we need new tools to deal with uh, the process of optimization. So these developments of introducing different types of RMAs in the schedule give range to a wide range of very practical models that have never been studied before. So 
What we do in my thesis is we propose a unified <coughs> modeling framework uh, which has, uh, which studies hundreds of practically relevant scheduling models and uh, with changing processing times and rate modifying activities. Now traditionally, a lot of these models dealt with either deterioration uh, conditions or learning models or position dependent models or time dependent models separately. I mean, there have been entire books written on simply time dependent models. And there have been surveys only focusing on deterioration effects or learning effects and so on. So, never before uh, has a study been made in which we bring together all of these effects under one umbrella and study them from a unified modeling framework. So, so unrelated families of models have now, in my work, been put together so that we can study the similarities and dissimilarities between each other and solve them using some common tools. So the range of problems considered in the thesis are as follows. So as I said, there can be two types of effects, deterioration and learning effects. And we mentioned three types of uh, models that are used to incorporate these two effects. It could be a position, de a position dependent model, a time dependent model, or cumulative. So we went through the mathematical formula for these in a previous slide. Another thing we can do is we can combine these effects with different rate modifying activities. So rate modifying activity, as I said, can be different in nature. So I, what we do is we divide our problem categories into three distinct subcategories that if the RMAs are identical or not, if they fully restore the machines or not, if the durations are constant or if they are start time dependent. A start time dependent duration means that if a machine is uh, maintained later, it takes longer and longer to repair it. And Lastly, we have one of two objective functions, the make span, the total, or the total flow time. So these are, in its entirety, all the different kinds of models we will be studying. So we could have a deteriorating model with time-dependent effects, with an RMA which is identical, which does not fully restore the machines, is time-dependent, and what we need to do is optimize the total flow time. So we could have several hundred combinations like these. Also, an optimal solution will give us one, uh, all of these four decisions. So the first one is we will know how many rate modifying activities to include in the schedule. The second decision that an optimal schedule uh, will help us choose is the choice of RMAs. That we may have a list of, say, capital K different rate modifying activities, and the decision maker needs to choose K minus one of them. The third is, uh, we will know the sequence in which these RMAs should be performed. Uh, they are not identical in nature, so it does make a difference what's the order. And lastly, we need to find out the optimal permutation of jobs. So, these four decisions collectively will form an optimal schedule. Uh, an example from a previous study, so that's a paper by Kyo and Yang, published in George 2008. So this was an algorithm running in order of NK time. So it was a deterioration order. They used a polynomial position dependent effect. The RMAs were identical, they fully restored the machine, and the durations were constant and they minimized the make span. And this took order NK time. Uh, sorry, I'll go back here. And there have been many other such papers which deal with deterioration with exponential position dependent, yes, yes, constant make span. Another one could be deterioration, exponential, no, constant make span. And there have been different papers for each such combination. So the idea of the thesis has been to combine all of these studies together 
so that there is no need to publish a single paper for 500 different options that can result from these. So what we do is we propose a unified algorithmic framework to study a whole bunch of these uh, problems which are possible. And what we find is that even if problems are unrelated, for example, problems uh, which are position dependent and time dependent, they come from totally different families of scheduling problems. And even if they're unrelated, we find that there are some common uh, characteristics which can help them, help us classify them into a single family. And for each class, what we do is we design a solution algorithm that solves an entire class of such problems. So a class of such problems can have 10 or 15 different problems from that table, and we design a single algorithm that can solve all of these. So what this helps us do is it helps us extend the boundaries in terms of generality of the problems being considered and the efficiency of algorithm design. Because if we know that some problem can not be solved in less than order in square time, and it makes sense to make that problem so general that at, even at the limit of its generality, it's still order in square. So there's no point considering a less general problem. If you're spending in square time, you might as well have a very general problem to solve. So, also we have made some effort in making the algorithms more efficient so that uh, even for the existing problems which are simple in nature, we demonstrate an improved running time. Okay, so the challenge, the main challenge, the crux of the problem when it comes to rate modifying activities of a different kind is to know how many jobs to schedule in each group because all the groups are no longer identical. Had they been identical, we could just have an equal number of jobs in each group. Now, the main challenge is how do we know how many jobs to schedule in each group. Previously, as I said, since groups were considered to be identical, a group balance principle was used in previous papers, or some authors also used a total enumeration technique, which is very expensive for simple models. Uh, what we did to solve our problems is we classified all the problems, let's say there are 500 possible problems from that tree, we classified them into different categories, and some of them cannot be solved without full enumeration, so we put them in one category. There are others which may need partial enumeration, there are others which can be, we can find the number of jobs on the fly and so on. So we classify different sorts of problems and use an appropriate algorithm to find the optimal solution. So I'll quickly go through the algorithms we decide and tell you the scope when it comes to such an organizational chart. So the, the most general algorithm we came up with was, well, I call it the algorithm one, which takes a lot of time, order n for k plus one log n time. But it can do all of these things simultaneously. So it can consider a model which is deteriorating, which is learning, which can have any positional dependent effect since we're using a general function gr for it, so it can be exponential, positional, uh, polynomial, whatever. Uh, it could also have a linear time dependent effect. The RMAs do not need to be identical. They do not need to fully restore the machine. The durations are start time dependent. So if this is the most general sort of a problem, and they can, and this algorithm can solve either the make span problem or the total flow time problem. So all of these effects combined together can be solved in order n plus n to bar k plus one log n time. There have been papers in the past which solve exactly this problem: deterioration with exponential, yes here, yes here, total flow time here, and it still takes, and it still takes the same time. So there's no point in trying to solve such a problem when you're going to spend an exact amount of time, n to power k plus one log n time. So what we proved is that if you're spending that much time, might as well have a very, very general big problem so that all of it can be uh, solved in one big grand problem. 
So the main idea behind this algorithm was to break down <coughs> the objective function into such a format, which basically can be solved by the Simon problem uh, with the product matrix. So such a problem can be optimized in order n log n time by uh, the matching algorithm proposed by Hardy in 1934. And we systematically use the same algorithm in many of our uh, algorithms. However, for some reason, this technique has been lost. And a lot of authors do not use it. So we have written a critical survey uh, in EJOR that mentions about 80 odd papers which could have used this technique uh, to solve this n log, in n log n time, but they decided to use the full form of the sun problem and use n cube time. Okay, the second algorithm that we propose is faster, but it's less general. It can only do deterioration, it can do positional, identical, doesn't need to be identical, doesn't need to fully restore, can be start time dependent, and from make span. Uh, this takes order n k square time. The same algorithm can be also used to solve a linear time dependent model, which was a big surprise for us, because these two families are totally different. So it turned out that an algorithm that can solve position dependent effects can also solve the linear time dependent effect. So this algorithm is again based on the same matching principle, but to find the number of jobs in each group, we use a novel technique, uh, which I will not go into much detail now but we do not need full enumeration, basically. Uh, another algorithm is even faster, but it's uh, less general. So to make an algorithm faster, we compromise on the generality of the problem. That's the idea. So the next algorithm is on an NK type, and it solves the less general problem. So it's deterioration, position dependent. They need to be identical. They need to fully restore and they can be start time dependent and it's makes well. Uh, again, the same algorithm can solve another problem in which they do not fully restore and the durations are constant. And it does the same for linear time dependent effects. So uh, as you see, the same algorithm can solve a variety of classes of problems. As I go through slides, it tells you which category it belongs to. Okay, now the fourth algorithm is even faster, but still less general. And what it, uh, again, it can be used for both position and time dependent models. And the speed up is obtained because the objective function, which turned out to be this for such problems, we proved that this turns out to be a convex sequence. So if it's a convex sequence, we discovered that we do not really need to search for all possible options we can search for log k comparisons then a full k comparisons. So a speed up was obtained because of this uh, non-trivial proof that we did for proving convexity of this sequence. Okay, so another algorithm dealt with cumulative effects. So we have now done positional and time dependent effects. However, when it comes to cumulative models, it's a new family. It's a new family of models. And uh, this turns out to be an NP hard problem. So what we do is we create an FP task, which solves the problem in order n by epsilon time. So again, another cumulative problem in which the durations are start time dependent. We have another algorithm for that. It solves in order n squared by epsilon time. Uh, so the, the logic behind these algorithms is that the FP task is designed based on the fact that both the problems, they relate to the subset sum problem and the half product problem. So the existing FP task has been modified in some way. Okay, so when it comes to, this was everything related to single machines, so we did not do much when it comes to parallel machines, uh, but a lot of these algorithms can be directly applied to parallel machine scenarios, but only for the total flow time objective. 
uh, we did not really deal with para machines for the make spawn objective. But what we did was we performed an analytical, analytical study to see what the impact of adding an extra machine can be to an existing set of machines. Now this study doesn't formally belong to the area of scheduling and changing times, but it has the same uh, idea of having some logistic decision making involved with scheduling. So this is somewhat different, but while we were dealing with parallel machines, we stumbled upon a good result and we published it. So I am near the end, just the last two slides here. So basically, uh, to conclude, the impact of the research has been quite significant uh, when it comes to uh, the weight of the problems being considered, considered and the algorithms that have been designed which solve a whole lot of problems in a very efficient time. Uh, the results, they form seven journal papers and they've already been cited 80 times in the last, in under two years. So it has made some impact in the scheduling uh, research. Uh, also due to the impact, we have been offered to write a book by Springer, which should be out in 2016. So I'm quite happy with how things worked out here. Uh, the future scope, <coughs> there were some gaps in when I was showing, when I was moving those green blocks around, there were some green blocks, uh, there were some white patches still which did not have an algorithm to them. So the future scope is I want to fill those gaps and cumulative effects have some uh, ways to solve problems which we couldn't earlier. So there are uh, five, six classes of problems which we still don't know how to solve, but that's for future. The other is, uh, we want to collaborate with industrial partners so that our theoretical framework can be have some practical application. So uh, we have, uh, I have been in talks with uh, certain people from the industry who are willing to share the data from machines so that we can see if our model is fit or not fit or what we can do to improve them or not. Uh, so I feel especially in the advent of uh, the Internet of Things, which should be a big thing in the next five to six years, ten years maybe, where collecting data from machines should not be a big deal. Uh, this research can be very relevant to that, and I'm looking forward to finding some really interesting possibilities. So thank you, and these are just a list of publications if someone is interested in following the work, and that's it for me. Thank you. Time for one or two questions if uh, anybody wanted to ask Kabir anything about his work. So, Chris. so um, is there any possibility of extending any of these results to different objective functions like the weighted flow time problem or the um, minimizing maximum lateness? Uh, yes, uh, <coughs> the reason we haven't published it so far is because the main idea was to have uh, some completion times and once you have that, the other objective functions can follow. So we came to a stage when the positional weights have been found and then it was easy to go on to other objective functions. So we haven't done that ourselves, but we hope someone will cite us and do it. <laughs> so, because uh, the extension is easy. I was just going to ask you mention about the bits you haven't done. Do you have thoughts on how you can approach those well, problems? I, when I was doing a PhD, we, I did struggle a lot with these problems. We left them, we reached somewhere, did not publish them. We're still trying to make them better and, and publish the results, basically. So we have ideas, uh, just that I'm not too confident yet. Okay. okay, perhaps we could thank Kabir again for his talk.